Now, I would like to invite and welcome our chairperson for this international conference, Mrs. Laila Jacob, President GTEF. Ma'am, it's, it's an immense honor to have you along. Your areas of expertise have been as a content writer in effective communication, in career counseling, as a contributor of the GEMS book, and as an online content developer for English and economics. Uh, Ma'am, in your technical session, there are nine paper presentations of 10 minutes each, including three minutes of discussion. Our first presenter is Professor Ananya Guha. Thank you. Sir, please. Thank you. I'm Ananya S. Guha, and I'm from Shillong in Northeast India. I would like to talk about the changing contexts in education today, vis a vis adapting new pedagogies. Perhaps the first thing that will strike you is. What are these changing contexts and why are they changing? Uh, what do we have in mind when we say that contexts in education are changing? You refer to the four pillars of education, which, if I'm not mistaken, the Delos Commission report enunciated as learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together. And in my humble opinion, the biggest challenge is learning to live together. That is to say, how do we assimilate all this information that is coming to us? How do we assimilate it and transform this into knowledge? How do we transform information into knowledge? Perhaps if we do that successfully, we will be able to live together. The theme of this conference highlights a pluralistic society. And we can think of Indian society. Or we can think of divergent communities or nationalities in one country, like, say, in the US. But the whole idea is giving education this edu ethical responsibility to enable people to engage themselves with the other, so that the other is a part of the whole. And in this way, we can look at education very holistically. What I also mean to say is that the contexts of education are changing because technology has come into education in a big way. When William Caxton invented the printing press, there was a technological revolution the printing era. And that's why we have print also as a form of technology. If we look at the open system of learning and distance education, we will see that it starts off with the print media, then goes to the television, the radio, and lastly, the computer or the internet. Many have forgotten these other technologies and concentrate mainly on the internet or the computer as the primal focus of the changing contexts. True, it has really radicalized education. But it is also true that the radio, the television, and the print media also have contributed to learning, whether you call it distance learning or conventional learning. Unfortunately, we have compartmentalized education into distance and conventional, traditional and non-traditional. Education is continuous, contiguous, and holistic. And if we look at the total picture of education, we will see how the contexts have changed and how media and technology has come into education in a big way and transformed education made education more sensory. We will also have to re remember that there is something called edutainment. That is a combination of education and entertainment. One way of teaching effectively is through the computer because children and young boys and girls take to it very readily. To lecture through the television is also interesting for the young mind because they take to the television very readily. 
the same thing can happen with the radio uh, the popular thinking is that with the advent of the television <coughs> the radio will take a back seat in today's life it has not ha happened so in fact it has become doubly popular look at the fm stations that we have today a plethora of them and they also are using technology to disseminate information and learning so that is basically what i'm trying to say is that the contexts of education are changing and that is happening because we are adapting and adopting new technologies in to education thank you very much i would uh, re now request um our honorable chairperson for further discussion good afternoon uh, professor ananya guha you have already explained about the four pillars in education and the role of edutainer edutainment so from the word entertainment we have already included entertainment and education and we have got edutainment do you think that this edutainment is going to help the present day learners yes uh, i think it will help because you see there must be some uh, pleasure in learning you must derive pleasure why do we you know avoid classes sometimes because we don't we are too used to the chalk and talk and we find everything is a rigmarole but if technology comes in something that appeals to our senses and you know uh, however imperceptibly affects our senses then we are attracted towards it a young student that they told me that uh, now this teachers come and just give the links to their topics who who can do it i can also do it so teachers should know that students also are demanding but what they want is something to be done in an interesting manner all right sir uh, you have told that uh, entertainment is very very important i do agree one more question i would like to ask you do you think that this entertainment has to be given ultimately in the hands of the children or the students or how can you ensure that they are using this end entertainment in the best possible manner yes because you know they can phase out their studies they can phase out their studies in terms of hours or the credit system so they can concentrate some hours on the study texts then radio then television then the internet browsing and so on if they space out their studies then <coughs> learning or studying will have less encumbrances and will be more pleasurable all right uh, with that i would like to add one more point sir because uh, supervision of the teachers in a very partial way is also will help because uh, we want to have the, the best possible outcome so little intervention by the uh, teachers may help to get the best outcome uh, you have spoken very well sir thank you so much what was your question madam i have just started sir the need of the supervision yeah all right yes right yes supervision is needed that is why in distance education we do not use the word teacher but call them counselors uh, they advise and to facilitate learning thank you it's uh, excuse me that excuse me right. madam i have to add a point with the question that is entertainment could not be considered as an end but it must be viewed as a mean yes a special kind of uh, combining right elements of entertainment in the process of learning so that uh, the outcome will be more enriching as well as it will yes. the or the perception will be more like yes, that sir. yes sir yes so here yeah, thank you so much uh, professor yeah. anand guha now i would like to invite dr as our next paper presenter dr ali molly vergis and she'll be she'll be presenting on fostering metacognitive practices in children for enhancing learning outcome and cognitive development uh, dr molly the platform is yours i am dr ali molly vergis from peet memorial training college mahavelikera 
and I would like to present a thematic paper on the topic fostering metacognitive practices in children for enhancing learning outcome and cognitive development. And this paper intends to explore the metacognitive strategies that can be adopted in our classrooms for enhancing the learning and cognitive development of students. Metacognition, as we all know, is thinking about thinking. More precisely, it refers to the processes used to plan, monitor, and assess one's understanding and performance. Thus, it includes a critical awareness of one's thinking and learning, and also an awareness about oneself as a thinker and a learner. Now, the need for metacognitive practices. Dunning and his colleagues in their study found that people are unaware of their incompetence. That is, they are lacking insight about the deficiencies in their intellectual and social skills. And they also identified this pattern across different domains, that is, from test taking to problem solving skills. They also observed that if people lack the skills to produce correct answers, they are also cursed with an inability to know when their answers or anyone else's are right or wrong. That means only with the use of self-reflective practices can one identify their deficiencies and work for overcoming them and also for enhancing the abilities that the, they themselves possess and others possess. And now about the importance of metacognitive practices in learning. Metacognition has proved to be very effective uh, in developing students' higher order thinking skills, support learners' ability to self-regulate. Uh, the use of metacognitive thinking and strategies enables students to become flexible, creative, and self-directed learners. It also improves the cognition in all students at all levels of ability. It allows them to become aware of their own thinking and to become proficient in choosing appropriate thinking strategies for different learning tasks. And in fact, good teachers are also highly metacognitive. They reflect on their expertise and teaching and refine their pedagogy accordingly. Now let's see how metacognition works. I have already mentioned that metacognitive practices increase students' abilities to transfer or adapt their learning to new contexts and tasks. By thinking about the tasks and contexts of different learning situations and themselves as learners in these different contexts, students are able to transfer their learning to new situations. And for this, students must know about the different kinds of strategies for learning, thinking, problem solving, etc., so as to apply them effectively. And also, a key element in metacognitive practices is becoming aware of one's strengths and weaknesses as learners, writers, readers, etc. Recognizing the limit of one's knowledge or ability will help people in figuring out how to expand that knowledge or extend that ability. For students to become more metacognitive, they must be taught the concept and its language explicitly as pointed out by Pintrich and Tanner. And it needs to take place over an extended period of time and not all on a sudden. And we should note that metacognition instruction should also be embedded with the content and activities about which the students are thinking. Because metacognition is most effective when it is adapted to reflect the specific learning context of a specific topic, course, or discipline. In explicitly connecting a learning context to its relevant processes, learners will be more able to adapt strategies to new contexts rather than assume that learning is the same everywhere and every time. Many theorists organize the skills of metacognition into two complementary processes. One is the knowledge of cognition and the regulation of cognition. Knowledge of cognition has three components, namely knowledge of the factors that influence one's performance, knowing the different strategies, and knowing which strategy to use for a specific learning situation. Next is the regulation of cognition. It uh, involves setting goals and planning, monitoring and controlling learning, and assessing results and strategies that are used. In the light of the above uh, discussion, let me bring to your notice certain metacognitive practices that can be incorporated into e-learning courses, social learning experiences, pre- and post-training activities, and other formal and informal learning experiences. First one is asking questions. During formal courses and in post-training activities, 
the instructor can ask questions that allows learners to reflect on their own learning processes and strategies and in collaborative situations also learners may be asked to reflect on the role they play while solving problems in groups next is fostering self reflection the key to metacognition is asking yourself self reflective questions which are powerful because they allow us to understand where we currently are how we learn and where we want to be that is whether we have mastered the material or not teachers should emphasize the importance of personal reflection during and after learning experiences and encourage learners to critically analyze their own assumptions and how this may have influenced their learning another point is encouraging self questioning we can foster independent learning by asking learners to generate their own questions on the topics learned and answer them to enhance their comprehension thinking aloud using writing taking notes from memory practice tests etc help in this process and self testing helps students to become more efficient in understanding what they lack and what they need to focus on we can also teach strategies directly teach appropriate excuse me yes, ma'am ma I'm, i'm extremely sorry to interrupt and i <laughs> but we're running short of time and okay, uh, since the session yeah yeah sure okay, okay. Uh, i would like to invite uh, honorable chairperson for further discussion all right ma'am uh, i was uh, keenly listening to your discussion it was uh, really wonderful uh, only one thing i want to ask is deficiency in skills be the source of assessment you told about deficiency in skills my question is is deficiency in skills be the source of assessment self assessment ma'am you do you mean self assessment uh, uh, self assessment as well as assessment by the teacher or, or the facilitator also any yes a deficiency in skill can be assessed by the teacher or we can assess ourselves where we are proficient in a particular skill or, or not and we can uh, practice that skill so as to develop proficiency in that particular skill all right so how can you, how can we say that we can master the material because learning has no ending you said that we can master the material so what do you how can you explain that master the material this is my own uh, for my own enhancement i am asking please yeah learning is a lifelong process and so right we have to uh, practice this metacognitive skills so that we ga gain a better understanding of the uh, things that we learn or the co concepts that we acquire that is what i meant ma'am Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, Ali Molly, and um, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Oh, Vidhi Tondial, yeah. who will be presenting on impact of problem-solving abilities yeah. and metacognitive skills in nurturing the multicultural um, uh, mathematical aptitude of a learner. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, very good afternoon. to honorable chairperson and all the respected dignitaries uh, i'll just like to share my screen right now uh, well as uh, we all know that today the uh, main theme of our, our conference is uh, focusing on the contemporary teaching skills teaching pedagogies so uh, let me first introduce my topic um, the topic is Uh, the impact of problem solving abilities and metacognitive skills in nurturing the mathematical aptitude of the learner so as the theme of today's uh, conference is uh, talking about uh, contemporary teaching pedagogies so let us now talk about what are the objectives of these teaching pedagogies so if we talk about ncf 2000 the basic uh, objectives with which it has been framed is to inculcate the various core life skills like problem solving focusing on thinking self awareness 
and so on. So the basic objectives of NCF 2000 is to inculcate the skills in the children like problem solving, decision making, and various other core life skills. Similarly, if we talk about uh, NCF 2005, it has categorized the aims as narrow and the higher aim, and emphasizing on higher aims. Uh, we are here emphasizing on developing various logical uh, conclusions, handling abstractions, and ability to think and reason mathematically. Now, why mathematical education has been emphasized over here? So let us try to understand. Because mathematical education develops the ability to explore, to conjecture, to reason, to communicate mathematically, and overall becoming confident of one's own ability. That means developing a very confident personality. So mathematics teaching is uh, just not learning about complex mathematical concepts. Basically, it is the training of one's mental cognition. It is the training of various faculties of human mind. So. Yeah, basically, uh, learning of mathematics is substantiating the learning of various other subjects also. So how can a teacher substantiate learning of mathematics in the classroom? Firstly, he should be able to correlate the complex mathematical concept with the real world around him. And secondly, uh, the teacher must be able to know and identify the mental cognition and aptitude of a child. So what is mathematical aptitude? We can know this by a simple uh, example of Carl Gauss, a great mathematician, when he was in class two. Uh, he was asked by the teacher to add up all the numbers from one to 100. And uh, while uh, he just came up with the answer in few minutes, not because he was very good at calculation, but just because he was able to see the relationship. What relationship? He just uh, wrote the numbers in one series and uh, in the ascending manner and just below it in a descending manner. What he saw that the sum of each term of the series came up to be 101. So this 101 multiplied 100 times becomes 101 into 100. So automatically the sum of one series will be 100 into 101 divided by 2. So this is how we can generalize the sum of series as n into n plus 1 upon 2. So this is what we call as mathematical aptitude, which is determined by the unusual keen awareness of numerical information, uh, quickness in learning, and working abstract with the numerical patterns. So this is how a uh, mathematical system, now we just, we just have to learn about mathematical system, how it works. See, uh, mathemat you one has to have a clear knowledge about mathematical laws, first of all, and then you should have the ability to use those laws in a new situation. Okay, so uh, when he is using it in a new situation, automatically he is uh, uh, very much liable to create a new law, to generate a new law. So this is what we call as problem solving. So of course, problem solving is an integral part of mathematical learning. And even uh, Ganesh hierarchy, we can see he has considered it as a topmost level of the hierarchy. So how does problem solving generate? So uh, let us start with thinking. Thinking is the basic step. What is thinking? Thinking is just internalization of the overt activities in the form of images, ideas, concepts. And whenever this thinking, uh, this stepwise thinking uh, with a goal or an aim in our mind take place, this is what we call as reasoning. Okay, so the end step of reasoning becomes problem solving because problem solving is integrating of our past experiences in a very in a new situation. So this is how uh, problem solving is considered as a very insightful process. The second construct is metacognition. As we have already known, uh, metacognition is often referred to as thinking about thinking. Basically, it is an awareness of one's thought process and uh, ability to be uh, to know the uh, the patterns of our thinking structure. So uh, various studies have been uh, conducted. Uh, in which there was a strong relation was found between metacognition and the problem solving ability. Because if one is very much confident about uh, his metacognition, so he will be confident about his, he will be less susceptible to make error in the problem solving. Okay, so uh, second construct that we will talk about is anxiety. Definitely, there are uh, various studies that indicate that a person with uh, low anxiety is uh, having a good metacognition and automatically he will have an effective problem solving. So basically, when we give, uh, when we think of giving a training of metacognition to a child, now what are we training him for? We are making him to answer <laughs> questions. Yes, sir. Any any problem? Okay. 
uh, he has to answer basically three questions. Do I understand the words in this problem? What operations are needed to solve the problem? And do I have any difficulty in having uh, in difficulty in completing the question? So if he can answer these three questions, automatically the confidence will be built up in him and he will be uh, susceptible to uh, create less error in solving the questions. Now we come to another construct that is the gender difference. Uh, various studies have shown that boys and girls shows difference in their mathematical ability. If we talk about boys, they are, the study shows that they are good in automatical reasoning, special ability, problem solving, mathematical aptitude also. And if we talk about girls, they are somewhat superior to boys in automatic fundamentals, rote learning, computation, logical thinking, and so on. The, even yes. uh, some even if we talk about the styles and patterns, uh, female uh, generally prefer conversational style, while male they just stick to argumentation and individual comp encouraged competitions. Uh, it was an amazing presentation, ma'am. I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, now I would like I would request our honourable chairperson for for the discussion. Uh, the discussion was indeed uh, really awesome. Uh, and uh, one question only I would like to clarify. Uh, yes, where anxiety is not there, how the child will be able to perform in the best possible manner? When anxiety is not there, how the child or the student will be able to perform the best possible manner? Anxiety, ma'am, anxiety has been in the studies which I have seen here. Uh, the, the, uh, negative correlation was found in achievement and anxiety. Definitely anxiety uh, just uh, uh, poses an impediment in the path of the learner and in his performance level also. So if anxiety is not there, if it is minimized, definitely metacognition helps a lot in minimizing the anxiety level of a child. If he is trained in the metacognitive skills, definitely he is able to control his anxiety. And if anxiety is not there, the problem solving efforts will be uh, uh, effective, will be done, You can be used in an effective manner. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, our next paper presenter is Dr. Kazi Firdoshi Islam and who will be presenting on the topic tools and resources in multicultural education as pedagogy enablers. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson, ma'am. Uh, my topic that I've done is on the sub theme transformation uh, from homogeneity to multiculturalism education. And uh, I'm, I'm an assistant professor working with uh, the faculty of education at Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, my theme, the title that I have selected, ma'am, is uh, on this uh, topic. It's uh, tools and resources in multicultural education as pedagogy enablers. Now, I would just request if we focus on the icon in the first slide here, ma'am. Uh, the tools, the, the teacher is surrounded by the tools. We have a pen, we have a smart board, we have uh, a talking tool which is used by the children with uh, special needs. Then we have a library, a book, stack of books which shows a library as a resource. Then we also have this electric gadgets. We also have a telescope which caters to the uh, pedagogical approach of inquiry-based learning, collaborative approach, reflectivity, constructivism. Then we have uh, a, a book, a single textbook, a very good book is there, and obviously a bell. Now, generally, uh, when we see a bell, we feel it is a bell which dismisses a class, but is actually a teacher which which dismisses a class. And that is why I put a teacher in the center of all the icons and resources. Here, I would like to present, ma'am, on the notion that teacher is the greatest resource in a classroom. That is why when I say resources in multicultural education, my focus would be exclusively on using teachers as a resource or how the teacher can enable themselves to be resources in a multicultural classroom. And uh, the tools that I talk about would be the pedagogical strategies. Now, if I take the uh, Cam Cambridge Oxford Dictionary tools, tells it is something that helps us to do a particular activity. And as a teacher, the aim of teaching learning is the acquisition of skills and learning outcomes academically and obviously creating conscious citizens to live in a democratic world. So these are the pedagogies, the tools which are adopted and adapted by teachers in their uh, curriculum, in their curricular experiences journey. 
when I talk of resource, uh, if you look into the Oxford Languages Dictionary, resource is any stock or supply of money, materials, staff, and other assets that can be drawn on by a person of, or an organization in order to function effectively. Similarly, resource is a useful or a valuable possession or quality of a country, organization, or person. And we all know that teacher, teachers are valuable resources of any country. So essentially, ma'am, this paper is a theoretical paper, and it dwells to, uh, on, the, uh, on the notion that how teacher can be an effective resource if a teacher uh, has the ability, has the knowledge, rather, the knowledge of models and approaches, both pedagogical and multicultural, that can be used in a multicultural classroom. And we all know a good teacher makes a tremendous impact upon a classroom. Uh, and there's a very well-known saying that teachers influence till eternity. So if this position of a teacher teaches themselves worldwide, internalize themselves uh, to be the cornerstone of any kind of education, then I think we can have a wonderful concept of multi multicultural education where curriculum can be adapted, adopted to see, suit students' needs. Now, if we look into this uh, slide where the tools are actually the different uh, pedagogies or the teaching strategies which are used, which, which can be used in the hands of teachers to transact the curriculum, to transact the curriculum experiences. And ultimately, it is the aim of education to enable students or uh, to create future ready citizens rather to face the world and challenges of 21st century. Uh, by transforming the young minds into being responsible, caring adults. So it is a teacher who has, who has to be so resourceful that she can cater to the present as well as the future because teachers touch the future. So that is why the different pedagogies, of uh, different strategies, curricular as well as, I mean, academic as well as co-curricular, co-curricular, whatever strategy she uses, if she can use them. Now, the second slide here. Here it talks of tools and resources. Now, resources. Why teachers are the resource? Because teachers are the pillars of education. If they fulfill the transaction, the curriculum experiences to fruition. And uh, we all know a good, effective teacher is one of the greatest resource in a classroom. So resources here would be, be the knowledge of models and approaches which teachers can use in a classroom. And if you look into the literature review, just a quick one. Uh, there is a very positive school improvement when there is uh, uh, when the school culture is related to the academic needs of the students, especially in terms of diverse students. Uh, the uh, the sorry the uh, study by Blankenstein Hostin talk about this. Similarly, at all Oaks at all talk about a long term caring relationship where the curriculum is rich where it caters to diversity, where teachers work collaboratively through all the pedagogical approaches. It leads to the concept of effective schools. And if you look into the Lizard and Jajobi's nine correlates, out of the nine, multicultural instruction and sensitivity definitely is one of them. And if you look at all the nine correlates, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. So there are seven correlates which exclusively focus on the teacher. So that is why I feel teachers is the greatest resource in a multicultural classroom, any classroom, and more so in a multicultural classroom. I mean, if you look at it, focus on the student acquisition skills, if you look at the appropriate monitoring of students' progress, practice-oriented staff development at school site itself, where teachers can actually communicate with the administrators, because these are the areas in we really need um, staff development or continuous professional development and salient parent involvement. It is the teacher who has to create that network with the outside community. Similarly, effective instruction and organizational management, instruction during the academic hours, as well as the organizational arrangement, the entire journey of teaching learning process. Similarly, high operationalized expectations and requirements for all students. This can be operationalized through the portfolios which teachers make. Even in the Indian context, right to education tells us that teachers have to do a continuous and comprehensive evaluation of all their students. So this is incumbent upon the teacher to maintain portfolios of students. So the students' learning goals, I mean, kind of an educational action plan, actually, a multicultural action plan. Um, excuse me, ma'am. Um, 
I'm running out of time. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm afraid, I yes, you are. Two minutes, ma'am, quickly. Uh, I actually, the timer. If you could just go <laughs> two minutes, I'll just wind up because it's just starting. Uh, oh, just, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'll wind up in two minutes. Now, when we look into the uh, significance of school culture, multiculturalism, we realize that there is no one way of doing things because there is no one pedagogy. Uh, okay, I'll skip into this. I'll skip the definition. Why we need uh, the four uh, conceptual models actually in multicultural education are the contributions approach, addictive transformation, social approach. Now, the first three approaches are kind of tokenism, where we just habitual rit uh, rituals and all that of different cultures we celebrate. Addictive is, again, maybe organizing a school fair, school melas. Transformation and social approach, these are the kind of deeper level engagements where actually students of different culture are engaged into the real participation process. Since we do not have much time, I will not go into the details. Now, the approaches which teachers must be aware of, which will help them to become a multicultural educator. This is teaching the culturally different, the human relations, single group studies. Here in the Indian context, we have a lot of this tribal education where the tribal er uh, volunteers from those areas have to come into the classroom and teach. The new education policy has talked a lot about that. Now, I would like request our honorable chairperson for further discussion. Uh, it was already been told by Dr. Kasi that teacher is the main pillar. I do agree with her. And then in a heterogeneous classroom, how can you ensure that the teacher is the main pillar of education? Teacher is one of the main pillars. Teacher, teachers are generally the pillars. But in a heterogeneous classroom, madam, out of the many resources, because different have, teachers have te different teaching styles, students have different learning styles. So, but the greatest resource is a teacher. If the teacher acknowledges that, most of the time the teachers do not even acknowledge or appreciate or even understand the cultural differences which is inherent in every child. So that is why the teacher is a resource. If a teacher has that kind of understanding, have that insight, only then she'll be able to understand um, the cultural differences. So that is why in a homogeneous classroom, teachers resources in terms of teachers equipping oneself with the knowledge of different cultures, the different pedagogies, and mostly how to transact them. That is why that. OK. Mom was telling that the teacher is the hub of or the network, the center of the network. How can you ensure that the teacher will become the hub? A teacher through her resourcefulness, ma'am. If a teacher is resourceful, if she can then gain uh, practice in the kind of skills only then she'll be able to uh, act it out a teacher can be the hub if she has that capacity within her to actually utilize all everything within the classroom she is a decision maker she is a facilitator we have all kinds of work so that is why she's the network she's the main link which connects to all the other networks she's the main lamp ma'am which will lead all the other lamps all the other resources a resource can, a lamp cannot la uh, light other lamps if it is lit itself. So unless a teacher is resourceful, so that is why she's a resource. She can use the other resources in a classroom, homogeneous especially, uh, effectively. I hope I All make myself clear, ma'am. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kazi. Now Thank we you. have uh, now our next paper presenter is Dr. Balbir Kaur and Dr. Manmohan S. Jassal who will be presenting on role of emotional intelligence in development of metacognitive skills of uh, the learners. The mind that opens to the new idea never returns to its original size, said by Albert Einstein. Uh, very good afternoon to uh, everyone. And thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my paper uh, entitled Role of Emotional Intelligence in development of metacognitive skills of the learners. Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize, think about, and regulate one's thoughts and emotions, which impacts one's behavior and habits. Metacognition, on the other hand, correlates with our ability to think about what we think or do and how we do it, thus linking it with our emotional intelligence. 
a healthy school climate needs attention to not only cognitive and academic learning but also to affective and emotional learning since learners are different in emotional intelligence and other personality traits they may choose different metacognitive strategies for their learning being aware of such learner differences and preferences might enable educators to provide better ways of training learners regarding the different tasks which can in turn bring about maximum absorption of their learning input emotion has a substantial influence on the cognitive processes in humans such as perception attention learning memory reasoning problem solving etc tests examination homework and deadlines are associated with different emotional states that encompass frustration anxiety and boredom even subject matter influences emotions that affects one's ability to learn and remember so educators must dig beyond grades and test scores as a measure of student success to the core strengths that help kids thrive in school and life the usage of computer based multimedia educational technologies are gradually replacing traditional face to face learning environments this may induce various emotional experiences in learners hence emotional influences should be carefully considered in educational courses designed to maximize learner engagement as well as improve learning and long term retention of the material metacognition is simply thinking about one's thinking it refers to the practices used to plan monitor and assess one's understanding and performance metacognition plays an essential role in the entire learning and life understanding outside academic learning when students procure awareness of their own mental states they also begin to understand others viewpoint now once knowledge concerning one's own cognitive processes or anything related to them is uh, the definition of metacognition and metacognition requires students to externalize mental events what it means to learn awareness of one's strengths and weaknesses planning identifying and correcting errors preparing ahead so metacognition is a lifestyle change in pedagogy for teachers it has to be a new way of learning and self discovery for learners self awareness and metacognition development should be part of what every student achieves in school it happens when teachers support students in order to enhance learning and aids them in their mastery of tasks teachers who foster student achievement not only understand how to teach curriculum but they also understand that student success develops from inside out i'm going to discuss about the compass advantage this compass advantage framework is designed to foster the development of a child's mind body heart and spirit it highlights the important systematic connection between eight core human abilities curiosity sociability res resilience self awareness integrity resourcefulness creativity and empathy research suggests that these abilities are key contributors to positive youth and adult development the compass advantage model is prepared by marilyn price michel and she has suggested eight pathways to every child's success the internal abilities these are uh, the eight pathways are the internal abilities that help young people grow into supportive family members innovative workers engaged citizens curious students and ethical leaders so if we if we are able to boost or if we are able to uh, uh, develop these eight pathways that every child has internally they are the internal abilities we will be able to help the, uh, them into the metacognition also so the first one is empathy which is the ability to recognize feel and respond to the needs and suffering of others and this includes caring compassion kindness patience so if we are teaching our students caring compassion kindness patience tolerance etc we are teaching them empathy also curiosity is the ability to seek and acquire new knowledge skills and ways of understanding the world and this includes critical thinking reasoning love of learning 
sociability ability to understand and express feelings and behavior that facilitate positive relationship it includes active listening self regulation fairness forgiving humility etc resilience includes perseverance initiative self confidence optimism self awareness includes self reflection vulnerability gratitude wisdom hope integrity is the ability to act in ways consistent with the values beliefs and moral principles and it includes courage honesty authenticity responsibility respect and resourcefulness includes planning decision making organizing risk taking negotiation La, uh, then we have creativity ability to generate and communicate original ideas and appreciate the nature of beauty and it includes aesthetics imagination playfulness originality inspiration mm -hmm. now when these abilities are envisioned as an internal compass it's easy to see how education and development go hand in hand how children steer successfully through school and life adding metacognitive content and pedagogy requires additional work and time it is not easy students are not willing they are not ready to give that extra engagement and they they are happy being passive and it takes more time and effort on both students and the instructors part both students and faculty need training in metacognition the pedagogy the routine self reflection and feedback teachers are responsible for not only how to teach curriculum but are also responsible to develop children into oh, capable excuse children. me ma'am and uh, yeah i'm i'm fine i'm, I'm sorry i'm fine. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too i'm compelled please please it's it's the last slide it's important to learn metacognition because of the awareness and understanding one gets from it so it is extremely vital that one develops emotional intelligence and learns about metacognition skills to understand oneself better student success must go beyond grades and test scores to include the development of internal strength so thank you so much thank you ma'am it was a, an intriguing topic and i can resonate to it as well now i would request our honorable chairperson for further discussion yes ma'am all right how can emotional intelligence ensure integrity yes ma'am it can ensure integrity because integrity is one of the very essential elements that needs to be inculcated in the uh, among the students and if integrity is not there in the students and uh, the students may not be able to develop metacognition in a better way and uh, get the two just to the learning process so emotional intelligence helps integrity by uh, developing uh, integrity into the students thank you thank you so much thank you so much ma'am thank you ma'am okay. now i would our next paper presenter is dr swati negi and she will be presenting on teacher facilitated collaborative approach effective use of project method for teaching welcome ma'am uh, good afternoon everybody uh, and my special regards to the chairperson and i can see on my screen uh, our honorable uh, professor dr akshay shivasa sir aapko bhi pranam madam aapko bhi pranam aur mera uh, hai project based learning based on pragmatism and the principle of learning by doing project method is one of the most used modern method of teaching by this topic effective use of project method for teaching which is teacher facilitated collaborative approach project method is one such educational enterprise in which children solve a practical problem over a certain period of time it involves guided learning working with hands and tools to design more advantageous technic technical modules project method comes from student centered dv's educational philosophy and is a modern contribution to educational theory and practice initiated by professor william head kilpatrick 
a pragmatist who is also known as the father of project method, who defined project as a wholehearted, purposeful activity proceeding in a social environment. The project method had its beginning in the United States in 1920 to teach technological education by providing students both theoretical and practical considerations. The concept gradually extended from manual training to vocational guidance and general sciences. The, the teaching, especially of vocational and industrial educators, used a series of small scale projects to help students increase competency in practical and to solve problems. Eventually, this filtered from colleges to schools with its basic elements of teaching strategy, which was quantity, purpose, significance, and interest and motivation of the learners. My slide has uh, skipped, and I would like to tell that the project method of teaching strategy is based on the principles of purpose, freedom, principle of utility, principle of experience, activity, reality, and social experience. A good project emphasizes on social needs and development, and also its usefulness to the society and the people. It has feeling of cooperation, group work, and socialization. The chief characteristics, as you can see, of project method is that it is carried beyond the walls of the classroom and in the natural settings. Project is a unit of educative, educational work which encourages investig investigative learning in the students. And it develops and encourages the spirit of scientific inquiry. It promotes a better knowledge of the practical aspects of the knowledge gained from the books. That means from the practical, from the theoretical part, it emphasizes on doing it practically. I do, I learn is the basic tagline. It enhances the social skill which the students acquire by interacting in the social environment. We have now PBL, project-based learning. Here, the teacher plays the role of the facilitator and not just a dictator. He allows great freedom to students and thus a real psychological boost. This encourages the spirit of research and helps them to develop the taste of in-depth investigation. The projects can be of two types. The first individual project and group project meant for every student or for a group or class of students. Or they can be classified into simple and complex projects, depending upon the nature of project which has been undertaken. But according to Kilpatrick, the father of project method, there are four types of project. The first is constructive project where the teacher constructs some theories, some things, and the learners are the one who develop those things. Second is the aesthetic project, also called as artistic project, where the learners develop appreciation power. That means the students develop appreciation power. Third is the problem solving, where the child finds solution to a given problem. And last is, and last is the drill project or the group work, like in singing, dancing, stage, where the students develop the skill and the abilities during the project. Next are the steps in developing a project. The first one is selecting the problem or purposing, planning, execution, and evaluation, also called as judging. The criteria, the first, very first step of selecting a project work is the criteria of selecting a project. It should have some educational value. It should be useful to the society and to, to the individual. In the steps of uh, doing the project, the students are given some practical problem among them, which they will select. It should have utility 
and it should also fulfill the needs of people. The various steps of project method from creating next, from creating situations, selecting the problems, planning and execution of the project work. It also includes the working of students according to their blueprint and planning. The teacher's role, as I will elaborate after this, will be able uh, is that he will be able to help the students to point out the problems and then excuse me ma'am huh? i'm <laughs> i have i arrived at the time where it's about to get you know it's about to be yeah. over so ma'am uh, could you please sum up huh. i come to the role of teacher the teacher here will be a friend guide and a philosopher he will be a working partner and help the student to work collectively and cooperatively we have a number of advantages like they will be helping the students to generate interest to have investigative approach and social cooperation constructive and creative thinking but the limitations of the project method i think are mostly that you should have uh, in depth teacher who can guide it is time consuming and costly whatsoever we say project method must emphasize on learning by doing and it should involve the students in investigating planning testing evaluating and improving during the project uh, fabrication hence i think the project method helps in self learning according to one's own abilities and interest thank you the most it's, it's an, it was an amazing presentation ma'am uh, now i would like to invite uh, our chairperson for further discussion um you were telling about i do i learn i do agree with that but how can project method ensure social cooperation okay the as defined by stevenson project method is carried out in natural settings in social settings so when they work in group there are two types of project can be there individual where he will take the help of teacher or it can be group so when they work in group we cannot go uh, not to take very deep examples of project we can have a drill work like singing presentation drama artistic Te students learn a lot by cooperation and only by help of each other so i think project method is a very good method to generate social feelings in the students okay thank you ma'am thank you organizers and especially usha patak ma'am thank you for giving me chance thank you very much thank you ma'am you are thank so you wonderful so thank you <laughs> thank you so much ma'am uh, i would like to invite the next paper presenter for today uh, Dr. Hari Priya Pathak and Ms. Vishalakshi Pant. Uh, most welcome, ma'am. A very good afternoon to the chairperson, professor, scholars, and all present here. The topic for my presentation is creating gender tolerance in the classroom. Gender is one of the most fundamental components of self-identification. It has an influence on everyone. It is distinct from sex, where sex is wholly biological, gender is a construct. Schools are one of the significant socializing agents where teacher plays a significant role not only in prompting gender equality and preventing gender stereotyping, but also in emphasizing on the importance of gender equality and in reducing the gender bias that takes place in a classroom. Gender bias refers to conscious or unconscious preference of one gender over another, and it is expressed in a variety of ways resulting in fear and underdevelopment of a child. Both boys and girls remain victims of gender stereotypes in texts and resource materials. They are also victims of unintended sexist behaviors by the educator. The following images have been taken from school textbooks. The image on the left hand side shows the occupations by gender in a Kenyan school textbooks. If we look at the image for an image, um, image for an the other image for which is of yellow color we see how the managerial and the accountant jobs are taken over by men whereas most of the jobs like sewing knitting or teaching are taken up by females in the the image on the right shows activities for mom and dad in a pakistani reader here we see it is clearly written that mom cooks dinner and dad reads newspaper magazine 
there are a lot of biases that take place in schools and most of the biases have been passed from generation to generation and we have normalized it to such an extent that we do not realize that we indeed contribute in widening the gap between gender educational researches have revealed that males are allowed to speak over females teachers are more likely to interrupt girls school textbooks and supplementary resource materials tend to be filled with male protagonists and stories studies have also shown that teachers often reward girls for being quiet rather than for prompting them to seek deeper answers the reasons of gender bias have been listed below if you look at this image we see that there are a lot of women who graduate but very few achieve stem degrees that is the science technology engineering and mathematics team is still dominated by a lot of males uneven access to education is one of the reason why women uh, why women have to face discrimination for example women have poorer access to education even now two thirds of the world's illiterate are women societal mindsets have been uh, have been engraved in our minds and they go deep even though there is a lot of changes through legislation and through law and even structural improvements there are certain mindsets that people have that seem very hard to let go of for example if you look at this picture we see how the nurse and the typist is a female whereas uh, the police and the driver is a male this also as well is shown from a nigerian um textbook in which the students learn about the jobs and occupations systematic discrimination often takes place through gender stereotyping and prejudice if you look at this picture which is taken from a 1962 textbook that was used in americans american schools we see how the checker teacher elevator opener typist waitress is a female whereas the policeman milkman mailman salesman fireman are all males so we understand how this gender stereotyping is happening and how this prejudice lead to gender bias many teachers assume that girls are worse at maths and they undermine their confidence at the same time teachers may also assume that boys are worse at reading or write them off because of their behavior activities like sports would work is still dominated by boys and activities like embroidery painting literature crochet are still considered as women's interest linguistic sexism is a very interesting term and it can be understood as the consistent and unconscious use of words and grammatical forms by teachers that denigrate women and emphasize the assumed superiority of men for example when boys get out of hand they are regarded as boisterous rough assertive rowdy adventurous whereas if girls do the same they are regarded as bitchy fussy catty silly so the terms that are applied to boys have positive masculine behavior whereas the categories used for girls are very derogatory when girls are deemed as unladylike for using rough speech the same speech uttered by the male counterparts is regarded as a part of normal masculine behavior and they are admonished less harshly this creates a linguistic double standard which can again be seen to contribute to long term gender disparity there are certain physical differences in gender roles this is a very interesting fact gross motor abilities cross motor abilities develop at the same pace for boys and girls but during the first two or three years of elementary school both sexes can run leap toss a ball and do other activities with similar ease however by the end of primary schools boys outperform in these skills and this is not because the boys have undergone puberty or this is not because they have become more tall or more stronger but the only reason for boys over over performing girls is that they is that they get encouraged because of the society they have a parental peer and societal expectation and encouragement which leads to this so if the same kind of encouragement and incentive is given to the girls they will be able to do the same uh when we look at this picture here which is again taken from a school textbooks in kazakhstan we see how females are uh, how girls are playing with dolls whereas boys are uh, are playing with cars there are social differences in gender roles that have been examined boys are more likely than girls to speak out during a class discussion even if they are not called or even if they do not know as much about the issue as the rest of the class similarly while working on a small project in a quiet group it has been examined that males tend to disregard the females remarks when we look at these two points we see how it is very similar to our society and how it mirrors our society for example when we look at this picture we see 
how the pattern of giving more importance to men's voices shows up all throughout our society. In elementary classes, mm -hmm. boys call out answers eight more times than girls, and girls who shout out answers are usually um, going to raise their hands. Uh, again, we see this uh, picture. I'll just wind up. So the distribution of praise and criticism also differs, as well as. Uh, for example, boys are uh, praised for correct knowledge, their misbehavior is overlooked, whereas girls are praised for good or compliant behavior and their incorrect knowledge is ignored. Uh, these are certain suggestions, like obviously examining our bias, girls should be encouraged to express themselves, they should look into the course, gender bias should not be reflected by any of the writings or teachings. As we saw before, gender sensitization is very important and it should be done not only to the faculty, students, but also to the parents of the students and girls and boys should uh, equally participate, there should be a zero tolerance policy. Uh, students should be able to share their ideas and um, an integral part of teaching should also include where be it like be it or entity, gender sensitization should be included like that. Um, here is, I would like to conclude with this picture. This is the before and after of Vietnamese textbooks. So this is a positive response. As we see that in the first picture, we see uh, the uh, girls um, or the females are expected to take care of the child, whereas later they have changed it. And there is a man here who's taking care of the kid. Similarly, here in this uh, textbook in Bangladesh, it portrays a woman playing football while man washes dishes in an Indian textbook. Thank you. References. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vishalakshi, the ma'am, Vishalakshi, ma'am. Now, I would like to in request uh, our honorable chairperson for further discussion. It was really awesome. Uh, you mentioned about the linguistic double standard. Yes, ma'am. How can we control uh, linguistic double standard? Now, also in the present day world, also we are already facing that problem. What is your viewpoint about how, what methods can be taken by the society or parents or elders to control linguistic double standard? The first step should be to identify, to identify where we are using the wrong terms. And only when we, because most of the gender bias that happens is happens very unconsciously. The, uh, for example, if if I see a, a girl and I uh, uh, compliment her, the, my first compliment would be on how she's looking. So it is very important to understand how we are complimenting different people. So we should not compliment them on the basis of their gender. And we should start to, we should try to compliment them on the basis of the skills that they have instead of the gender stereotypes that have already existed. Only when we'll be able to identify, we will be able to eliminate this problem. All right. With the, with the permission of the chair, shall I add one point? I'm sorry, sir, can yes, you come sir. again? Uh, congratulations, Vishalashi, for your uh, very comprehensive uh, you, presentation. You so much, uh, one one point that I have to highlight is that uh, uh, the illustrators in a textbook will work based on the content that is provided to them and based on the directions given by the editor. So uh, while uh, moving in this direction of uh, gender equity, what we have to do is that uh, the content development and content editing side, there must be a very strong movement, content selection, editing, content creation. Then only the illustrators can give illustrations uh, which we may highlight uh, uh, the gender uh, equality. Or otherwise, uh, just by seeing the illustrations which may attract the in, uh, uh, attention of all, uh, immediately we are concluding that uh, uh, that is the real evidence for uh, gender inequality yes. that may be a premature conclusion i may i fear so the content development the editing etc in that area we have to concentrate to solve the issue yes sir yeah thank you so much uh, sir and thank you so much ma'am thank, ma uh, thank you so much our honorable respected chairperson for conducting the session uh, in an outstanding flow and one I, I would like to invite i'm so sorry there was a little confusion on our end uh, please forgive us i would like to invite uh, our next paper presenter nilambri gupta and rashna joshi who will be presenting on expression 
a vibrant tapestry of learning for the mind, body, and soul. Ma'am, please, the platform is yours, and I'm really sorry for the confusion. That's okay. uh, thank you so much. And a very good afternoon to respected chair and my fellow participants. Uh, today, I would like to, uh, with uh, my partner, Mrs. Rachna Joshi, uh, would like to present our presentation on expression, a vibrant tapestry of uh, learning for the mind, body, and soul. Flow of my presentation is about learning through expression and for the mind, body, and soul, which happens in a school setup. So today, the focus of the conference being pluralism, we should realize that expression plays a very important role for it to survive and thrive. Because expression is something very stimulating and rich. And it can engage and fascinate learners across ages and across interests. So uh, with the changing paradigms of education, the children uh, belonging to a very scintillating and stimulating civilization, uh, it is no longer a filling up of a con container kind of a knowledge, but it is about the, a conscious human being who can learn, who can create, who can transform. And so uh, expression is that means where conveying of ideas, views, perceptions, and explanation happens. So for a pluralistic society to thrive, there has to be a free flow of expression. Now, expression also increases knowledge. It creates acceptance and tolerance. And it teaches us about how to be mindful. It brings about openness and equity in relationships. And there's a lot of enjoyment and enrichment of lives for the people involved. So acceptance of diversity and difference where there is free, free flow of expression is therefore, I would say, the, at the heart of pluralism. Now, when we talk of expression, it has myriad forms. It could be vocal, it could be physical, it could be emotional. And uh, what better a place than a school uh, for exp expression to foster and to uh, be encouraged? Because school is a sample of a very large population. So it is a multicultural interactive community where diversities are explored. And if uh, knowledge has no social resonance, then it becomes useless. So uh, embracing and appreciating differences, moving out of our comfort zones, uh, where uh, you know not sticking to our kind of people, but interacting. And so there is more flow of ideas and more learning happening. So a school, I think, is a perfect example for expression to thrive with all the differences intact. Now today I will take up the uh, take up Shikshanku, the global school, as a case study where we've managed to bring about wholesome learning for the mind, body, and soul, and it is very apparent there. Uh, we've managed to provide a safe and secure environment for expression. Uh, children are comfortable to express and to act because uh, they know that uh, there is a culture of non-judgmental uh, atmosphere is there and uh, they understand emotion, they respect perspectives. Uh, the dealing of uh, conflict uh, is usually uh, restorative in nature rather than retributive and uh, repairing the harm is what is basically focused upon. So uh, we do for uh, the follow a few uh, routines, we follow certain tools, we take, have, we've taken up certain tools and programs which help us in doing so. Meraki being one of them, Meraki as the name suggests, uh, doing something so soul, soulfully that leaving a part of yourself behind. So mindfulness comes under that where it talks about uh, being in the present moment and it talks about alertness and concentration and equanimity so mindfulness is a big thing at shikshankur where every day it is practiced with the teachers as well as the children the teachers also uh, collect in the morning uh, even on the online uh, platform we've been doing that where uh, positive affirmations and guided visualization brain uh, activities mental activities yoga breathing exercises all this uh, is done before they enter the classroom so there is more of calmness and more of focus uh, and similarly for the children where they do it for 20 whole minutes before the actual classes begin so uh, taking uh, the next program, Karuna, which talks about understanding compassion and empathy. Now, Karuna is taken up in uh, two ways. Uh, one is the global perspective for Karuna and one is the community outreach, uh, the humane part of it. Now, community outreach under that uh, various programs and various causes have been taken up by children. Uh, wherein they talk about things like Ek Mutti Dal and uh, Hari Kamai or Swachh School Abhiyan, 
where uh, they have understood the concept and they have uh, interacted with peers of their own age, maybe uh, less fortunate than them, and they have come out with uh, great ideas and it has been a great success. Uh, for the global perspective, yes, the children have been working with on the sustainable development goals. So it's not only about, um, yes, the limitations of the global of the online platform has been there, but uh, the understanding and in spite of the limitations, they have been uh, able to take uh, these goals forward. It could be like uh, the clean air or water and uh, gender inequalities yes they've understood them and taken it forward so first uh, these uh, programs actually foster intuitive thinking and there are many things uh, they require high order thinking skills also and for that uh, to happen there are other ways of expression like mind maps and thinking routines which are also used uh, as part of our daily classroom routines uh, where the children express their learning and thinking visibly through tools like peel the fruit or step inside or chalk talk or color symbol image so these and mind maps again which also help in uh, collaborative uh, reflection and assessment and creativity so all this has been a part of classroom uh, work katha kahani and abhinaya are the two other programs which as the name suggests are major forms of pedagogy as well as uh, expression and so uh, storytelling is a powerful tool it has been as old as uh, human beings i think and it does uh, it is an empowered and interactive expression Abhinay again uh, leads to building up of organizational skills, public skills, uh, public talking skills, and uh, confidence building. So all this uh, is yes catered to by Abhinay. So in the end, I would like to conclude that expression is guided by curiosity and creativity. It needs a lot of autonomy and liberation, but it helps in evolution and growth, and it leads to a lot of reflection, and it teaches us how to appreciate aesthetics, as, uh, appreciate diverse cultural values, identities, and ideas. So uh, thank you so much, and I hope I have been able to uh, vibrantly express uh, my thoughts on the topic. I'm all open to questions now. You have, ma'am, you have. It was an amazing presentation. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, I would request our honorable chairperson for further discussion. I was telling that the presentation was really awesome, amazing. And I do agree with uh, the speaker that school enjoys unity in diversity. Still, we are lagging behind. Can you please uh, ponder on that topic? How a school or the educator can ensure unity in diversity? Ma'am, schools are a hub of diversity because, as I said, that they are a part of the bigger organism. So when uh, and uh, there is no choice in school in a society living in a society, we do have a choice with who we interact and who we don't. But in a school, uh, children don't really have that choice. There are different teachers, different cultures, different children mixing, and the parent body and the community. So I think they are the perfect place for unity and diversity to thrive. And uh, as our old uh, Indian, this thing has always been about Vasudev Kutumbukam and unity and diversity, something which India as a secular state totally believes in. So school is a thriving and vibrant place where we can, you know, uh, really do a lot for unity and diversity. Beautiful, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Now I would like to invite our next paper presenter, Ms. Truti Das, uh, who will be presenting on the topic, Needs of Learner-Centered Approach to Improve Metacognition Skills. Ma'am, are you here with us? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, please, please. please Good afternoon to the dignitaries and all the participants presented here. Uh, I'm Zuti Das from um, Assam and I'm the faculty of Nolwai College Department of Education. So today the um, topic of my paper, of the paper is that I'm going to present is the needs of learner-centered approach to improve metacogn metacognitive skills. So first of all, if we uh, say about the skills or some metacognitive skills, first of all, we have to know about what is metacognition. So metacognition is a process that helps that learner to think what they are thinking means thinking beyond the thinking 
So, and uh, this process makes the student to may help the student to become a critical thinker, to become a creative, to monitor themselves, to monitor their own tasks. Again, and how to develop that metacognitive skills? There are lots of metacognitive skills. So, um, due to the shortage of time, I am going uh, through some selected points. So, there are some metacognitive skills like what uh, understands own capacity. A student should understand what uh, they should, what they are learning, what are their memorized capacity, how they think. Next one is that they should monitor their strategy of learning. So if um, a student should monitor if that strategy, that strategy that they have adopted is useful or not if, if it is not useful then they can modify so they can monitor their own status strategy and their um, and their performance and their success too so to make them to improve that skill this is their um, a teacher so the role of the teacher is to take up the learner-centered approach so what is learner-centered approach is that the learner-centered approach is that makes the uh, student so active as in where a student can uh, put their own viewpoint, put their own potentialities, use their own potential, use their own capacities. So how learner-centered approach impact metacognitive skill? So first of all, that to develop metacognitive, a learner-centered approach, a teacher should adopt that provide a teacher will adopt some steps like what provide opportunities and motivate learners to learn at their own pace that a teacher should not um, a teacher should not be a what spoon feeder he should allow his students to share their ideas to uh, develop their creativity to use their potentiality second one is what a teacher should create an environment that develop the readiness that develop a curiosity in, uh, among the students if that curiosity is developed then only a learner's uh, learner is ours to explore the things so the second point is what a teacher should develop creativity and readiness among the students again the Third one is what a teacher should encourage for self-evaluation. Self-evaluation in the sense that what a learner should know, what they are learning, how they are learning, what to read, how to read, how they are what strategies should adopt according to the performance. So a teacher should encourage, a teacher should encourage to evaluate themselves. A teacher should encourage the learner to evaluate themselves. If they, if the students find something that they should modify their strategy, they should modify their technique, then they can modify. If they are the spoon feeder, then they can't understand what they are learning, what are their capacities, what are their limitations. Again, they, again, a teacher should also organize a democratic program like the debate, an extempore speech where the learner can use their own creative mind where the learner can use their own rational thinking so metacognition is a process that um, that makes the learner a creative person that makes the learner a creator one and learner centered approach is the pillar so without learner centered approach metacognition skill can't be developed because if uh, a teacher if a teacher centered uh, suppose a teacher if a teacher um, spoon feed a teacher give the materials to the student what uh, how to answer what to answer then why how when the learner will, will use their brain so um, my topic is that that we have to use learner centered approach to develop that metacognitive skill thank you Thank you so much, ma'am. Sure. It was indeed an amazing presentation. Now Thank I would you. like to invite our, our honorable chairperson for further discussion. So you are uh, focusing on learner-centered approach. In this pandemic condition, when the online classes are going on or blended learning is already going on, how can we ensure that learner-centered approach we are already practicing in our day-to-day -day life, us being the educators? Uh, there is both the pros and cons in the approach because suppose if we adopt uh, in this pandemic, we are using um, technology. Maximum, uh, the students are using technologies and uh, for that, there um, we can say that 
uh, learner centered approach in this sense that students are become technologically equipped they are using they are getting the what um, the knowledge of technology how to use again the assignment they are doing the assignment they are doing the, there is also they are using creativity suppose what that uh, how to write the sequence they are understanding and the um, means pros uh, the disadvantage is that that most of the learner in suppose in examination in examination time most of the learner they just copy paste the things because there is no evaluator there is no supervisor to see them what they are uh, writing how they are writing so uh, in this pandemic the learner centered approach both there uh, there is both advantage and disadvantage in my few point all right ma'am thank you thank so you. much ma'am uh, thank you all the presentations were extremely insightful and uh, knowledgeable uh, i would now uh, request our chairperson for today uh, to conduct to convey the concluding remarks i'm really happy to be the chairperson for this particular occasion pondering on the topic contemporary teaching pedagogy in pluralistic society the teacher education department dav pt college dehradun in collaboration with the same that is council for educational administration and management uttarakhand chapter i really congratulate and wish the organizers the very best in the coming days too because this is an initiative which has been taken by the two organizations to ponder on the topic the change in teaching management typically involves the introduction of alternative teaching methods here lies the modification of conventional methods of teaching by means of chalk and board method and the teachers have to give way to the stt that is student talking time should be more and the teacher talking time should be less when our speakers were already speaking on different topics they also emphasize the importance of the students role in learning the things when we are giving importance to the students when we are already giving that much importance and emphasis to the students they will come to know that yes learning to know learning to do and learning to be and learning to live together learning to live together in this pandemic condition has already made us and enabled us and uh, already allowed us to understand that what is the importance of learning to live together so i would like to conclude by saying that change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time we are the ones we have been waiting for we are the change that we see this these are the words of barack obama necessity is the mother of invention in this pandemic condition and whenever the normal situation will come that time also whatever we have practiced at this time it is not going to go away it will be there blended learning will be there cognitive approach will be there and project method will be there and everything whatever we have discussed will be already been going to exist and we cannot say that these all things whatever we have practiced and discussed is not going to be disappear so let the spark in the revolution and evolution of education can be started with us so with these words i would like to conclude that today's uh, uh, thought as well as uh, expression and the conference was indeed really very good and uh, i am really ha very happy to listen from the learned educators the renowned educators once again i extend my thanks to dr usha padas and uh, the moderator as well as the same organizers also thanks a lot once again thank you so much ma'am to maintain such an outstanding flow and facilitating a thorough exchange of knowledge now i would like to invite our organizing secretary dr chetna thapa to convey the concluding remarks for today Thank you, Nivedita. I take the privilege of concluding the sessions of the first day of the two-day international conference on contemporary teaching pedagogy in a pluralistic society, organized by 
टीचर एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट डी ए वी पी जी कॉलेज देहरादून इन कोलेबोरेशन विद सीन उत्तराखंड चैप्टर द की नोट स्पीकर फॉर टूडे डॉक्टर ए पी मोहनन को फाउंडर थिंक प्रेजेंटेड ऑन द टॉपिक क्वालिटी ऑफ एजुकेशन वॉट हाउ एंड वाई वी वॉन्ट द लर्नर्स टू लर्न ही हैज मेसमराइज द स्कॉलर्स ऑफ वेर इड कैलिबर विद हिज इंटेलेक्ट एंड चार्म ऑल ओवर he focused on the educational goal which is to help children develop their understanding abilities and dispositions he expressed the essence of philosophy with varied examples what do we exp expect learners to have learned why do we want them to learn and how do we help learners to acquire what is specified he expressed the importance of national education policy 2020 which insists on unpacking higher order cognitive abilities of the students independent learning independent inquiry critical thinking critical reading the higher order cognitive or abilities were well explained through examples he insisted the scope of teaching not limited it to what a classroom teacher does in the classroom but included the entire curriculum including educational goals textbooks classroom yes. activities activities outside the classroom assessment and so on professor stephne maria eger was the first panelist in the panel presentations session and the topic was noticing and understanding drawing inspiration from design processes she focused on the taxic knowledge and introduced the dictal term and proximal term with elaborate examples the topic was thoroughly novice and would definitely contribute in the field of education and initiate a transformation in the educational sector dr hari priya patak the second panelist of the session presented on the topic promoting gender equity and equality in the classroom she focused in the most fundamental component of self identification external gender identity which is actually affected by the society the gender stereotyping was well expressed by the speaker she reflected on the role of teacher in gender equality and equity gender equality leads to maximum utilization of the potential of an individual and helps in promoting economic prosperity peace safety and a healthy society professor luis michael cardoso the third panelist of the session presented on the topic challenging the future of education and skills learning campus 2030 he focused on the new framework for this crisis to reshape curricula and learning environments to the needs of the 21st century the four pillars of learning that is learning to know learning to do learning to be and learning to live together were well expressed the brainstorming session of the storehouse of knowledge at the thirst to explore and contribute more to education professor kesan begi was the moderator of the panel presentation session who moderated the discussion session very professionally the queries of the participants were answered by the panelists in due course of time the panel presentation session was followed by three parallel technical session chaired by mrs lela jacob in boardroom 1 in boardroom 2 it was jointly chaired by dr geeta gopinath and dr rinki while in boardroom 3 it was jointly chaired by dr shunauli chakravarti acharya and dr pooja walia the papers were from varied disciplines with uniqueness in their perspectives this platform has indeed paved gateways for more researches the views of the paper presenters through research papers and concept papers would definitely contribute in the field of education and would contribute in bringing a transformation in the educational field finally we have come to the end of the first day of the conference i take this golden opportunity to thank the keynote speaker the moderator the panel presenters the chairperson 
and co-chairperson of the three parallel technical sessions for contributing to the event and for taking out time from the busy schedule. I thank the paper presenters and all the participants of this conference for enthusiastically attending the function. Thank you all. We will join tomorrow again for another productive day of interesting and stimulating discussions. Till then, wish you all a good day ahead. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all once again. Thank you so much.